talk about a classic biocontrol program. And when Hans and I were going through the system, really classic biocontrol and augmentative biocontrol were the ones that got the most attention, especially for organic growers. And today we see a lot more going on, not so much with biocontrols, but with biorational insecticides. So it's a difference. The focus is gonna be on this insect we see here in the video, the spotted winged Drosophila. And we can see it putting an egg right there into a plum. Here's it laying an egg in a strawberry. Look at its oviposter, look at its butt end. And you can see how it's kind of cutting and cutting and cutting. We see in the pictures up above that the female has got this very jagged, sharp cutting tool, an ovipositor. And down here, we can see as she walks away, she's putting an egg into the strawberry. So unlike other vinegar flies, this allows her, the female, see it, she comes up, there's the egg. That's the breathing tube right there. So that allows her to put an egg into fresh or ripening fruit, whereas the other vinegar flies put eggs into rotting fruit. So this is why this species is such an important pest. Uh, it found, was found in 2008. It spread now throughout the United States. So what I'm describing today is part of a national and in fact, a global project. We're working with researchers throughout the US and we're working with researchers in Europe based in Switzerland and Italy as well, because this pest is now everywhere in North America, pretty much, and in Europe. This is the life cycle. You can see the egg that was just laid, three larval stages, then a pupil stage, then the adult. It's called the spotted wing Drosophila because the male has got these spots on its wing. And this is what it does to the fruit. Maggot goes inside, starts to chew away at the fruit, brings in different kinds of pathogens, uh, and just basically, no one wants a fruit with a maggot in it at all. And I want to point out, it's important to note that it goes from an egg to an adult in just 10 to 12 days. So that means you can control one generation, and then another adult population can come in from the outside, and you've got to treat again. It also means that a lot of the organic farmers are using contact materials. And because the egg and larva and oftentimes the pupa is inside the fruit, those contact materials don't work. So we have to come up with better controls. Here's just an example of uh, the picture up above in cherries, some of the damage we commonly see, and the common materials that are being applied to control spotted wing Drosophila. And what you can see here is that really only the pyganic and entrust or success um, and delegate are the organic products that are there available for you to use. Almost all the, all the other products are either an organophosphate, a carbamate, or a pyrethroid, all of which can disrupt bees. And in fact, some of the organic products, the pyganic and entrust, um, may be softer on bees, but delegate, not organic, uh, can harm the bees as well. The most important thing about any of these products is that you have to apply them fairly frequently. That's because the spotted wing has this huge host range. So you can have wild blackberries, wild blueberries. You can even have cactus near your field. And these are all hosts for the spotted wing Drosophila. So you might put on a material for that first population that comes in as your fruit's starting to ripen up and then four days later, five days later, if you're using organic product, you've got another population coming in from these, what we call riparian habitats. Or another way of looking at it is that the pest has found a refuge outside of your crop field. So if you're planting blueberries and you're next to a stream or a ditch bank that has got wild raspberries or wild berries of any kind, the spotting will come in week after week after week, which means you've got to spray repeatedly. And that's just not sustainable. And it's not something that we can do and still make a profit. 
So what we want to look at is how we can increase natural controls from natural enemies. The first thing you do before you consider importing anything is look to see what parasites or predators are out in the fields right now that maybe we can use or manipulate. What we found in California was there were a lot of these pupil parasitoids. One species is called Pachycropoideus, the other is called Trichoprea. So this is a, a parasite that attacks the pupil stage of spotted wing Drosophila, puts an egg inside the pupa, develops to an adult, the adult chews its way out and it finds others to attack. There's all kinds of larval parasitoids in California. These are parasites that attack the larva of spotted wing Drosophila and they actually come out of the fly's pupa. What we found was that these parasites, and the different names are typically Leptopolina, Asobara, and there's two groups, one's in the family Fidgeted and one's in the family Braconidae. So these larval pupil parasitoids are abundant attacking vinegar flies, attacking these other flies that we find in the field, but not spotted wing Drosophila. They don't attack spotted wing. And what's interesting, it's because the spotted wind Drosophila, not only does it, has it evolved to attack fruit before it's rotted, it's also evolved defense mechanisms against these parasites. So here we see a, a parasitoid going through diet to attack the larva inside the insect diet. That's long tube here is the ovipositor. Think of the bee's stinger. That's what it uses to put an egg into the larva of the fly when it's in the fruit. What happens with most of the parasitoids found in California and found in, in the US and in Canada and in Europe is that the parasite has developed this defense mechanism. Basically the egg of the parasite that goes into the fly, that's an egg of the parasite right there. This is a close-up of the egg. And what's happened is that the fly has developed an, a defense secretion. It basically melanizes the parasitoid egg. So what that, hap what that means is that these two parasite eggs here that were put into the larva of this fly were unable to hatch. And that basically killed off the, um, the parasite. So there's this natural defense mechanism that this fly has against all of the larval parasitoids found in North America and Europe. So we've got these two groups. Um, we've got these two pupil parasitoids. They're found throughout North America, Pachycropoideus and Trichoprea. They've got a very large host range. That means they attack all client kinds of different fly species. The bad thing is that they've got very low natural levels of parasitism between zero and 10%. So they're not giving us control. But we could think about augmenting their numbers and we'll talk about that next. We've also got uh, these larval parasitoids highlighted here in blue, but they aren't attacking spotted wing in North America or Europe, which means if we want better parasites, we have to consider classical biocontrol. And we'll talk about that next. So first, augmentation with the pupil parasitoid. Second, we'll go into our classic biocontrol program. So here we've got our standard economic injury left level or threshold. Fly populations are going up, and then we add insecticides over and over and over again to bring the population down to protect our crop before harvest. When we think about augmentive biocontrol, we're really doing the same kind of thing. We're using a beneficial insect like a living pesticide. So we have to release large numbers of that parasite. And because the parasite doesn't establish for long periods of time in the environment, we have to release it commonly multiple times, or at least once every single year. And its population doesn't sustain itself, and that's why you have to repeat these releases. 
Um, here's an example of a raspberry caneberry field. It's a hoop house. This is in Salinas area with my colleague Brian Hogue at the USDA. We're giving him huge numbers of these pupil parasitoids. He's releasing large numbers in these hoop houses, and then we're measuring the impact. And we did this for the last four years. We did it also with colleagues in Oregon and in Minnesota. So we were providing the parasites for these three trials in the United States. Well, I don't wanna go into detail about this study because it didn't work very well. In fact, if I give it a grade, I would say the results were a C to a C plus. We were able to see a slight increase in parasitism rates. And we were able to see more of the parasite we released the pachycropoideus, than the other one, the trichopria. But we weren't able to really get a reduction of the fly density. So the pest was still there in large numbers. And if we compare that to work that went on in Europe, uh, we were in pretty good agreement. Uh, work in Italy, work in Portugal and Spain, I would say that they had from a C minus to a B grade. So a lot of people are not very excited about this augmentative control aspect. The only area where it worked was in Colima, Mexico. Uh, they were looking at four time increases in parasitism rate and a 55% reduction in the pest population density. And what's surprising about their study is that they were releasing far fewer of the parasitoids than we were in each hoop house. Um, so what we decided is that we couldn't get this augmentation of the pupil parasitoids, the resident parasitoids to work. So at the same time, we started a classic biological control project. And we did this with cooperators at CABI in Switzerland and our colleagues in Italy and the USDA uh, based in uh, Delaware and uh, colleagues in Oregon. The idea is that you go to where the pest is native to, and it's native to Asia. We searched in, in South Korea and China. You identify beneficial insects that evolved with the pest, and you bring them back to the targeted area, back to North America or back to Europe, and you release them. So what I want to do today is, is talk about that program and what can we expect and what are some of the hurdles we have to go through to get these materials into the United States and released. The classic biocontrol has a different way of working compared to insecticides and augmentation. You've got your fly population increasing above the economic injury level, and then you release not a lot of the parasite, but you inoculate different systems. So you go to California, Oregon, Canada, and you put smaller numbers of the parasite out. And theoretically what happens is that its numbers naturally increase. And then you start to have this up and down movement of the beneficial wasp that you released and the density of the host. And it lowers it below the economic threshold. And I'm open to any questions about this as we move forward. So here's our three insects that we were most interested in. And this study started in 2013. We spent five years doing foreign exploration, mostly focusing on South Korea and China, but also in Japan. And that was done by our colleagues in Cabi, Switzerland. We've got these two insects that are fidgetids, Ganaspis brasiliensis and Leptopolina japonica, and with this conid called Asobara. In Asia, uh, what we first found was that the kinds of parasites we got changed depending on how we were collecting them. When we were putting out fruit baited traps, in 2013 and 2014, we got mostly the Asobara. Uh, that's the one, the Briconid on the far right. In 2016, 
and 2017 and 18, we changed our methodology. We were collecting ripe fruit. And what we found was that that led to a change where we mostly got Gnaspis and Leptopolina. What happened in 2013 and 2014, we were getting other fly species like Drosophila melanogaster into these fruit baits and we weren't getting the fly that we really wanted, which was spotted wind drosophila. So changing how we collected focused more on the spotted wing. What kinds of parasitism levels were we getting? Um, well, it wasn't as good as we had hoped for. Um, the spotted wing is still a, a pest. It's still found in these areas. We were getting on average about 20% parasitism on most of our rubus species. And you can see here, we're collecting not in farms, but we're collecting in wild habitats. Uh, this is a little wild mountain strawberry. This is elderberry. On elderberry, we were getting greater than 60% parasitism. So when we think about our levels of parasitism right now in California, it's 2%, 3%. So if we were to get 20%, that would have a huge impact reducing the population of spotted wing in the natural riparian zones or that refuge population. So that might impact the amount of spotted wing coming into your crop fields. And it could be higher. Um, uh, that trial is out. So once we get this parasite into quarantine, we have to start doing studies to get it out of quarantine. It's not still in the United States when it's in quarantine. What we do is we have to send a petition to the USDA and that starts a federal action that looks at compliance with the Endangered Species Act and the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA. Both of these address risk. The petition has to look at a number of different characteristics of both the pest and the natural enemy. We basically have to prove that it's an important pest and to prove that the natural enemy we wanna release is a good natural enemy that will lower the pest density and have no negative consequences. Um, the petition then has to go not just to the United States, but to this North American Plant Protection Organization. Because if you release it in Washington, it might go to Canada. If you release it in California, it might go to Mexico. So everyone gets involved um, with this and it has to be shown to have no impact on endangered species. We also have to have it go through the tribal consultation because there are Native American populations and nations within North America. So both within the US and Canada and Mexico. And because it might impact their land, it has to go through tribal consultation as well and then get published in the federal registry. This whole process can take, well, it did take uh, about two to three years. Once we're done with that, APHIS makes an environmental finding, something called the FONSI is produced, it then gets republished in the Federal Register. And this whole thing took us three years and we finally got our permit in August, 2021. So releases are able to start now. Now, I just wanna go through some of the information that we have to develop for this. Remember that we cannot study this insect in the United States. We have to study it in quarantine and use information that we gathered from South Korea and China in our studies there. And the quarantine environment is not a real, it's not real life. Uh, we're studying this parasite in these little vials uh, on typically diet, uh, an artificial diet that the fly is reared upon. Uh, we have to look at, at strange things like the functional response of the different parasitoids. And uh, what these graphs show us is that the asobara, that top graph and picture, was actually a better parasite in the laboratory than the two fidgetids. 
uh, the, basically the functional response looks at the number of hosts attacked versus the host density you give it. And we see in that figure A that as a bara, you give it more spotted wing and it attacks more spotted wing. Whereas the two fidgets, figure B and figure C, the graph curve, the line is a little bit lower of a response. We compare these Gnaspis and Leptopolina, how many insects will they kill? So given spotted wing throughout their life, uh, both killed about 100. So they produced about 100 females, 100 offspring per female. And they lived uh, the adult for about 17 and 18 days. So both Gnaspis and Leptopolina, you know, in the perfect world, can increase about 100 fold each generation, which is great. Um, they tend, what this graph shows is the host age that they like to attack. Both Gnaspis and Leptopolina really like to attack the one and two day old hosts. They can attack three and four day old hosts. So basically they can attack any stage of the spotted wing, first, second, or third larval stage, but they prefer to attack the first or second larval stage. And this graph is just looking at the host A development time for Gnaspis and Leptopolina for the development time to become a female or a male. And like many parasitoids, the females, which are larger, take a little bit longer to develop, about 28 days. And the males take a little bit shorter, about 24, 25 days. All this becomes important when we're developing insectary rearing methods. And what we did in this study is we've got something called an olfactometer, which is just a Y tube that we put the adult parasite in. And at one tube, we've got clean air. And at the other tube, we've got rotten fruit, such as rotten cherries. So in this first graph, we're basically showing that all of these parasites when given a choice, will go towards rotten fruit or infested fruit more than they will go to clean air. If we look in the second graph, it's just basically saying they will go to rotted or infested fruit more than they will go to uninfested fruit. That becomes important because that means the parasite is going after fruit that's infested with one of these pest species, either, either spotted wing or the standard vinegar fly. But the most important thing the USDA cares about is that there's little or no non-target impact. They become very, very risk averse. So one of the things that we had to do was to test whether or not these three parasitoids would attack any of these other fly species in the United States, Canada or Mexico. And we couldn't test all the flies, so we picked a group of about 24 out. What this graph shows is our Asobara, Leptopolina, and Gnaspis. And it's showing if there's a bar next to one of these fly species names, it means it attacked it. So this shows that Asobara in this first grouping here it basically attacked almost everything we gave it. Whereas Leptopolina and Gnaspis were a little bit more discriminatory. And what we see here is that Gnaspis really was attacking the spotted wing Drosophila group, Melanogaster, Simulans, and Suzuki. It didn't really attack anything else. There's just this one off up here. So that becomes important, in fact, Leptopolina is a good parasite, but because it attacked a few other species, the USDA would not give us a petition to release it. So what becomes even more complicated is that the USDA denied our first petition because a paper came out during this review process that said, well, Gnaspis can be divided up into these different lineages. You can't tell them apart physically, 
But if you use molecular tools, you can see that there's this G1 strain and there are the other strains and that the G1 strain is a specialist. And this is work that was coming out of our lab colleagues in Switzerland. There are other lineages such as G3 that can attack spotted wing, but they're a little bit more of a generalist. And they wanted us to go back into quarantine and prove that the G1 could only attack spotted wing and a few others, just a little bit of melanogaster. Well, in fact, we did that work. Uh, we showed that we've got both G1 and G3 attacking spotted wing in our collections in South Korea. We've got uh, in red here, these other Gnaspis species. So it's, it looks identical to this work up here, but it will not attack spotted wing as readily and attacks other things. And in fact, we've got G5 now in Mexico, and we've got that same lineage in North America. So when we refiled this petition, they only allowed us to rear and release the G1. And in fact, most of the material, about 67 to 75 per 77% that we collected from South Korea and China were in fact the G1, and we got about 20% of the G3. So the petition we get is only good for the G1. And in fact, what we're looking at now, what this graph shows is that we've tried to do crosses of the G1 uh, females with G3s, G1 males with G1s. And what we found is that when we crossed the G1 with G3, we did not get progeny. So in fact, these might be separate species. I don't wanna go into detail about that, but I'll answer any questions that you might have. So we're only allowed to rear and release this one species and only a specific population of that species. <clears throat> so that does change our program quite a bit because the G3 strain can be reared on diet. The G1 strain has to be reared on fresh fruit because the spotted, the, the parasite is so specific, it will not even attack spotted wing in artificial diet. So we had to come up with these rearing methodologies uh, using blueberries to rear it. We're trying to figure out ways now to rear this insect on artificial diet. And we now have got colonies in my lab in California and in the lab in Delaware at the USDA. We also have got this parasite showed up in British Columbia and it has moved into Washington. And it is the, cor the, the correct lineology. It's the G1 that we want. So we brought that to my lab uh, in California. Our plan now is to start sending our material to regional insectaries. Uh, Washington, again, this is a national project. And we'll also send the material from Canada to these other laboratories as well. So just in summary, it took us about five years of foreign exploration about three years of quarantine study. We had to submit a petition in 2016 that was turned down in 2017 because of the different strains or lineages. And so we had to spend, another, and this is all very expensive. This cost us an extra $300,000 to do more quarantine work in 2017 and 2019 to understand these different lineages. So we submitted a petition in 2019 to only release G1, but to consider G3. That was approved in 2021. And now I've developed petitions for everybody that wants this material across North America. Uh, we have the petitions in hand. Uh, our studies are still looking at improving insectary methods. We've developed a coordinated release 
and Sampling Program from Canada to Florida, from Massachusetts to California. Uh, we're still trying to understand some of these molecular differences between G1 and G3, because we need to know the impact of these different populations across the United States. We'll do more studies to find out if there's any pesticide impacts on these uh, parasitoids. And we're gonna start to look at natural enemy interactions as well. So with that, I hope it was uh, interesting enough and not too technical. And I can answer any questions on what you can expect uh, for this parasite to help. But it gives you an understanding of, you can't just go to Canada or Mexico and grab this parasite and release it. That would be a felony, but we can give it to you and you can release it. And that's the way it's supposed to work. And we know that different insectaries are gonna to start to rear this um, and release it. But the hope is that from our program, it'll be there for you for free.